with that, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, we are very fortunate to have an extremely senior level panel uh, join us of, of professionals in that HR space. Uh, and starting off, I want to introduce Carrie Lane Prunella. Um, Carrie Lane was, was gracious enough to join us on a podcast a, about a week and a half ago that you, now you can listen to. Uh, it's available on Spotify, Google, and Apple right now. Uh, she is the Chief Human Capital Officer at the Commodity and Futures Trading Commission, has over 19 years of experience in the private and public sectors in terms of, of HR. Uh, prior to this role, uh, Carrie Lane was a specialist leader at Deloitte Consulting, served as Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Administration at the U.S. General Service Administration, Office of Inspector General. Carrie Lane, that might be the longest title I've ever heard. Um, she earned, uh, despite all of these other accomplishments, she earned her bachelor's degree in international politics from Penn State University, um, which is the first school I didn't like because they beat my Oregon Ducks in the 1994 Rose Bowl. Kylie and I are from that area, uh, really struggled with that one. Um, she is also one of the honorary members of the George Mason Management Advisory Board. So thank you, Carrie Lane, for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Here's Kylie Penn. Uh, she is the Director of Talent Acquisition for Global Technology Demand and Supply Chain Management at Nike in, uh, in Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, she's a dedicated, passionate talent acquisition leader committed to partnering with the business to hire the right talent at the right time. Uh, Kylie has uh, joined Nike several months ago after a career at Adidas, um, at Columbia uh, Sportswear, and at Comcast, if I remember correctly, all the different ones. Um, that she's been at before. Uh, they will, allow, and she can speak more to this in a little bit. And the last but not least, uh, April Armstrong, who's the CEO and founder of AHA Insights or AHA Insights? AHA Insights. Okay, great. <laughs> um, April is an expert on pandemic preparedness and response, business continuity, uh, catastrophic disaster recovery. She brings 25 years of experience advising national security, the White House, Homeland Security, and transportation sector leaders, including her expert experience with exercise top officials, for which Dr. Anthony Fauci served as a lead advisor. CEO of AHA Insights, uh, which helps businesses build and execute COVID-19 strategic recovery roadmaps. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank all the, the panelists and start opening it up to uh, to Christine to lead through the, the topics. Uh, for those of you who are in the audience, are, are, uh, once again, thank you for joining today. We would like you to ask questions of our panelists and to get their insights and get their perspectives. Uh, you can do that through the chat or the Q&A feature. Uh, the webinar feature within Zoom does not allow the audience to verbally ask questions. So we ask that you write them in either the chat or the Q&A feature and Christine and myself will moderate or continue to look at that to make sure your questions get asked. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Christine. Excellent. Thanks, Brett. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're excited today. We've got a lot to cover and not a lot of time. So um, we are hoping it's going to be a fast-paced panel. But to Brett's um, point, it is going to be really um, engaging if you guys ask questions. So we will keep a look at that. I did see Robert saying, I've got a computer behind me. Um, I'm obviously in my home office and um, it's actually my husband's home office. He, he runs a business out of our home. And so there's technology everywhere. I've actually turned that computer off so it won't go on because at times it turns on um, because people can remote access it. So um, the fun of working virtually. Um, and when I switch my background in Zoom, it makes me look like a devil. Um, sometimes my husband would say I am, but um, I will, I kept this feature so that you guys could, could see me and not have my eyes be um, devil-like in, in nature. So professional skills is something that I love. I spent 27 years in industry at Deloitte, um, an awesome professional services firm, got a lot of great insights um, from that experience, and now I'm able to um, teach uh, professional skills at George Mason, which is um, rewarding to see that it's something that they spend a lot of energy and focus on. When you look at stats out there, um, companies are looking for people that have strong professional skills, and the challenge challenge is not everybody focuses on them. I think at the end of the day, they're seen as very simple, uh, very you know, easy to acquire skills from a common sense perspective. 
The problem is they're not common practice. So what we want to do is talk about some of the things that you can do to make sure they are common practice in your life, especially in this COVID-19 world that we live in, where these skills need to be really amped up and exemplified um, and to a much greater degree because you don't have the face-to-face -face experiences. You don't have the ability to read somebody's body language. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get into some questions. Um, and again, please do ask them of your own because um, it'll make this whole experience a lot more fun. So um, when we look at kind of how to navigate in this COVID world and what to do, one of the things that we want to talk about is what are some best practices? What are some things that you're seeing working in this virtual environment? Um, so I'm going to go around the horn to the folks on the panel just to get their insights and, th and, and thoughts with regards to what are you seeing that makes people effective? I'm going to kick it off with one of my own um, just to kind of get it started. And that is to be seen. Um, one of the things that um, it's, it's great to be able to work in your pajamas and it's great to be able to have a very la relaxed environment and stuff, but you need to be seen in business these days. And so one of the things I would encourage you, whether you're on a video conference or a chat with your boss or, you know, collaboration with your um, peers in your office, whatever situation or a web conference like this, uh, where you have the ability to be seen is to be seen, to step up and to, you know, put on your video, put your hair up, that type of thing, whatever you do to, to be shown and be present, I think is super important. And being seen, um, we have fewer and fewer ways to make that happen these days. So I think that is one that's super critical to do um, and to focus on. So with that, April, would love your thoughts with regards to what can we do in this environment to stand out? To build on that, Christine, I would add, you know, be actively engaged and visibly engaged. You know, in an in-person meeting, if you're showing body language that shows you're paying attention, uh, you know, you're focused, you're agreeing, you're not so sure, that body language, language is very evident. In virtual meetings, and this is a perfect example, right, we can't see all 73 participants. If this was a corporate meeting, those folks could make themselves known to us by actively engaging, and hopefully they will even on this call, putting questions into the chat, signaling through systems that, the, that each of these virtual technologies have, like you know, raising the hand or saying that you like something, you know, giving one of those emoticon type responses that many of these systems allow, but demonstrating that you are actively engaging in your company's business is or your client's business is is harder in some ways um and more important than ever because you're not getting those nonverbals or those haptic signals that you would get in an in-person meeting oops there you go and you have to know when to unmute and mute yourself um from from that perspective so um Carrie Lane, I'll have you go next. It's funny, I keep muting you because there is feedback coming from your thing. So one of the things when you're in a meeting and you're present, obviously, is controlling the situation. I, I talk to my students this, about this all the time. And sometimes controlling the situation is controlling others and stepping up. And that's something to be mindful of. Um, it, it's interesting. One of the elements, um, obviously, of professional skills is, you know, kind of controlling the environment and the situation. And um, it, it's not always just what you do, but what you can control. So I will unmute you <laughs> and um, let, let you um, give us your thoughts in terms of what are some things that people can do. Sure, thank you. And it was funny because I pushed the button and went off again. I said, is that me? What's going on? So I was figuring between your, uh, the, the devil background that you had, I was like, maybe the system's possessed. What's happening? <laughs> But in all seriousness, I do think it's important to be very intentional with communication. Uh, I'm using my own personal example that I recently onboarded into my new position and I don't know my staff. I haven't met my peers. And so just sending an email and then stopping by someone's office is what I probably would have done in previous positions. But now being very intentional with subject line and my calendar right now looks like a complete disaster because I'll send a note and then put a calendar hold so that we can talk about it. And it isn't just a one-way communication and asking people to attempt to interpret my intent or what facial expression may have had when I was typing it. And so it's an opportunity for us to connect, being very intentional and saying, I'm sending this for your review, meeting invite will follow this so that we can discuss it. And then if there's other things that team members need to do that they're fully aware, 
but just using that and not solely relying on the convenience of email to translate a message. We don't have the full communication techniques necessarily. And so making sure that I'm doing that with my teams and, and being able to onboard effectively, but then also connect and assimilate with the organization. Yeah, and it's so interesting because I'm finding myself being that much more thoughtful at everything I do, which I think is, is important in general. But um, knowing that you've got such a limited uh, element. So something, you know, and I've talked about it for years in terms of the importance, like even of a sub subject line in your email, you know, if you need action from somebody, making sure that you're putting that in there, action required by date, put, you know, put it in. So being extra purposeful in everything I do um, from that perspective to make sure that there, the communication is clear. Um, Kylie, I know you come to us from the West Coast, which is awesome, a different perspective. What are some things that you are seeing and doing with regards to best practices in this space? Um, yeah, so it's, it's been very interesting. Nike is a very relationship based culture, right? We're based on a, a culture of sport, just like a sports team. And for us to pivot to a completely remote workforce has been, um, ha has, I, I think challenging. And even with my team, we sat in probably a space the size of my like living room. We would, we sat all together. So I think, um, I think a couple of things is, um, and, and our HR te teams and leaders have come out and just said, let's be empathetic and let's be, let's, let's just have some grace. Um, so I think leading with that and showing the empathy and understanding really just helps set the tone and the stage. Um, and for, for my team, what we, what we've had to pivot, um, our like meeting cadence I know it's something simple, but we now have every Monday we do a quick huddle and it's just, and I think, you know, intentional is, is, is an absolutely amazing and be intentional in everything we do. But like, I have to lead and say, okay, everybody just tell us what they're doing this week so we can stay connected. Um, and then we have a Wednesday, just happy hour where it's, we're not going to talk about anything about work. We're just going to sit and giggle and not worry about this pandemic and, and what's happening around us, but let's just be us. And then we have a weekly meeting where it is focused business updates, you know, a project updates, and it's very specific. So we've, we've refocused our, our calendar and our schedule of time of interactions. Additionally, we've used other, other forms of technology. So our, our business, we use Slack as some communication. So we've created some different Slack groups for just like, hey, key updates. And then um, we do have a, a silly, little group text as diff just different ways. So I think that's really helped the team stay connected in different ways. And then in different times where like a Zoom meeting, you can stay really intentional and focused, but doing that all day long is completely exhausting at the same time. So it's taking other things offline and even our one-on-ones, we do virtual walks and we're like, let's just get on a, on a call and walk around instead of being focus in Zoom. So I think it's like, I love the, the combination of you have to enhance your communication skills. You have to be super intentional. I think you have to have more planning, but also figure out those ways where you can create that connectedness. Um, the one thing I also think what's really standing out is for people who are highly flexible and able to deal with ambiguity. And um, because, you know, I mean, everyone, we're all dealing with this in different situations in our businesses, um, schools, children, et cetera, having to pivot like minute to minute or day by day, something shifts. So I think the people that are thriving are people that can deal with ambiguity. And I feel like that's just a, a capability that business is going to need. Everybody's going to need for the future. Excellent. And, and ambiguity is, is definitely a huge one, um, as is just adaptability, you know, making sure that you are able to just adapt to what's around you. I know we got a question or a statement in the chat with regards to, um, you know, a challenge is finding, you know, how do you control your home environment? So for instance, my dog is barking right now, which is a little <laughs> annoying, but that's the reality of the world that we live in. And to me, the good news is people are more empathetic um, to use, you know, some of the references that have brought, been brought up because they've been in that situation now. So before where 
things would happen in virtual environments. And um, if a dog was barking, it was, you know, why are you not in office? Why are you not doing this? It was seen as more of a negative. Now people are being overly empathetic from the perspective of, I know how it is to balance <laughs> and try to make sure that the home environment works, that the technology is working when I need it to. Um, I had obviously switched to teaching virtually and luckily all of my classes but one worked perfectly but it was that one where you know we were all trying to get together and the technology just didn't work so then having all these redundancy situations that's another reason i have multiple computers around if this one's not working then you know do i have the opportunity to switch to something else do i have the opportunity to switch to a phone call what can i do so being very adaptable is hugely important and being easy on yourself. You can't control all of it. So control what you can control and try to, but then realize you can't control everything. And so if I couldn't make one out of, you know, 16 classes, that's okay. You know, that's, that's still a success. Um, think of all the ones I did um, make and, and all of those kind of things. So how about sharing some fun, funny things now? What are some things that, you know, some oops, oops situations that people have done that I think our audience can learn from. So um, I'll, I'll throw out one and it actually didn't happen during COVID, but it was probably one of my more memorable um, virtual calls that I was on where somebody literally was vacuuming. And again, you know, you have to really pay attention to, oops, did the mic, you know, mute button, uh, you know, switch off or switch on. And I certainly, when I'm doing conference calls where I don't know, I don't have to be quote unquote on, I will do my dishes, I will throw in a load of laundry, I will do what I need to do to make my work-life balance occur. Um, but what are some of the funny things that have happened and, and how you kind of navigate around that? Um, I'll just open it up to anybody on the panel. So I'll start, uh, I have a six-year-old who is now a virtual kindergartner. And so when I have video conferences, I have to put a sign on the door, but in language that I know that she can read right away. I also visually put a chair so that she'd have to move it and then see the sign. I was on a call and she had come in and thankfully it was something informal. So it wasn't like a web meeting like this. And I was able to kind of do a motion to uh, to move her out of the way. It had a, a, a hockey stick nearby, so I just kind of you know pushed her <laughs> out of the way. But now it's part of our protocol that I write down. Mommy has a meeting, and if my husband has uh, the ability to give her an assignment to work on, and by putting that visual in front of the door to know, please do not enter on a call and put a chair. So if anyone else has that, that the visual obstruction does help with monitoring uh, people coming in behind you. <laughs> When I love it, if you see the hockey stick run. <laughs> it's the adult it. version of a fort. Do not Yeah, it was her. like a crook. You just kind of move her on. <laughs> April or Kylie, anything to share? I mean, I think... Uh, I, I think there's just been funny situations where um, people are in all different situations where they are trying to manage children and young children. And my, my, I have teenagers, so they'll, I mean, I'm surprised they haven't walked by, but they're kind of like in and out and they'll wave. Um, we just kind of like roll with it and everybody's like, oh yeah, what's, what are your kids? So I think it's just being like super open and flexible and know that we're all, you know, we all have our own situation. It's all a little different. Um, uh, you know, we have, we have a person on our team that literally goes out to the garage because he has, you know, like all of a sudden you'll hear an 18 month old, just like screaming wildly. Um, and I think you're just like, Hey, just take a minute. It's okay. Um, and we get on, my dog has hopped up on me. Um, and we just kind of like, okay. In the mornings I have to go to a certain space where I can block myself off. So I don't wake everybody up. And then I shift to my, uh, my afternoon space where there's a little more light and they can be in the main living space. So we've tried to just create our own little spaces and rhythm and routine. And that's just been kind of helpful and silly. But I think just, I think it's just having grace with everybody has been the, the biggest thing of like allowing others to, to say, it's okay. We get it. If your kid runs across, it actually makes it kind of funny and we get to know each other in different ways. Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, you know, everyone's probably seen some of the pop culture funny things like at the Supreme Court where the toilet flush got recorded on the Zoom, you know, or the, guy, the news guy that, you know, had boxers on under his, his top news outfit. Um, but Kylie, I really agree with you. I think ironically, 
there's really a humanizing um, and, and there's an intimacy kind of, you know, with folks through these virtual technologies, because we're all now seeing inside of each other's lives and each other's, you know, families and pets. And I think, you know, the key is certainly making that effort to, to demonstrate respect for your, your colleagues and, and the business at hand. And yet also allowing space for that openness and, and that laughter because life will intervene in the backdrop of that camera, you know, and I kind of like, if you guys have seen John Krasinski's some good news show, you know, he just has that magic marker sign. SGN, you know, and, and even some of that playfulness where it's appropriate, you know, um, I, I think is totally okay, you know. Yeah, no, we it definitely, to, oh, yeah, go ahead. Say, we try to do, we, on our little virtual happy hours, we try to make them fun and do silly things. Um, we try to do virtual karaoke. That was a disaster. I don't recommend that. Trivia is a good one. <laughs> don't do virtual karaoke. <laughs> But I, but I think the, the total element of um, really getting to know people on a different level, because, you know, you can be great friends with colleagues and you don't often come into their homes, you know, as, as or into their office in their homes. If you're going to come in, it's going to be something, you know, more centralized and stuff. Um, and so I've gotten to know things I wouldn't have probably picked up on um, with colleagues, which has been fantastic, you know, seeing their space, seeing what's important to them, seeing that type of thing. And I think it's about being vulnerable and, and sharing that and realizing, you, you know, we're not all buttoned up pretty all the time and that kind of situation but still making yourself be seen even in those kind of things and finding some compassion and alignment and relationships build based on everybody's vulnerability. And, and we're all going through that and we're all trying to figure it out. Um, Kylie, one question that came in with the chat, which I'll ask you since you're on the, you know, the West coast, one of the challenges that has been raised is, you know, how do you hold virtual meetings across different coasts with three hours differences and, and stuff like that? And, as interesting me teaching, some of my students went back to China and Korea and trying to teach with you know 13 hour time zones and stuff like that. What are some tips people have for working in that type of environment? Yeah, so we, I mean, I work, we, you know, I have, um, I have a team that sits in Europe. We have one that sits in India. Um, I mean, we have calls at just off hours. Um, I think it's just us being, um, what we've tried to do is shift them out a little further because it is like in the middle of their family time when we've, when we've had calls and just, I, I think it's just being more intentional and mindful. So we've just said, Hey, when really works and Hey, can we, everybody send pre-reads? So then the meetings can be shorter and we can just be really mindful of others lives. Um, but you know, for global companies, we, this is something that just, we, we deal with and we work with and we've been doing it a lot. So actually it's kind of the same thing. Um, but I think it's just really understanding the pers the person's personal situation and what they have to do and saying, Hey, you know what? It's okay to, 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 it's okay to close your, your video. If you want to on this, if you are making dinner, but let's just chat and know that it's casual. So I think it's just kind of setting, setting that stage first and, and, and then on gaining understanding. But for us, we've been doing, you know, this type of work with our global teams. Yeah. Time. And I do think to your point, there, there is more understanding uh, in terms of let's make the time we do spend together very much more effective. And so let's make sure that that pre-read gets out in enough time for people to prepare, you know, when they can, not, you know, 20 minutes before a meeting, but in enough time for people can to prepare. And then let's make the meetings shorter, more direct. And I've seen meetings shorten as a result of this, which again, I think is an effective meeting practice. April, it looks like you were going to say something too. I was just going to add, you know, we will also sometimes rotate the times of our calls so that it's not constantly our European partners or our West Coast partners who are up in the middle of the night or up at four in the morning for the call. You know, we'll sometimes like rotate that around. So we all sort of take a tour of the inconvenient call time. But I concur with everything else you guys have said as well. Excellent. Well, one of the areas we wanted to get into is how do you stay organized? So what are some tips that everybody has in terms of staying or, or, or uh, I can't even speak today organized while working virtually. So what are some of the things we've talked about, the importance of agendas and, and having that, but what are some other things that you guys are doing to really stay on top of, um, especially as you look to this blending that we have of our work and our family life. Um, I know when I was in 
especially in heavy grading mode, my, I, I was having terrible neck pain and I realized, A, I was sitting on my bed, you know, trying to grade, trying to be efficient, trying to be comfy and being there for hours at a time where when I'm doing it in the office, I'm getting up and I'm talking to coworkers and I'm, you know, coming back to, to that. So having to purposely set up a schedule where I take breaks and um, there's some amazing online platforms. Um, George Mason has all staff and, and students have access to a platform called Burn Along. And I can put on a five minute long neck and shoulder reliever um, video to, to do, and then I'll come back to my work. But having those breaks um, was incredibly helpful to make me stay healthier long term. You know, I was starting to do things that were causing, um, you know, severe pain and, and all those kind of things. So what are some things that you guys are doing to blend life and keep it organized? April, we'll start with you. Okay. Yeah, I think this is, I'm, I'm so glad you're asking about this, Christine, because, you know, this, it is a lot harder to be on virtual meetings. It takes a lot more energy. And in my case, I run a business. So my clients, we're not all on a same shared internal email server. So we're not all able to see each other's calendars when we schedule meetings. And what that creates is 12 hours of back-to-back -back meetings with no breaks. So I'm really glad that you are, are mentioning this. Um, I think it's really important to try to um, hold some boundaries where you can in some cases, like, um, you, know, uh, you know, maybe even with your small teams and stuff, kind of carving out, hey, 12 to one or something like this is, you know, communicating out that you're simply not available in that one brief window of the day or 12 to 12.30 or something like that. Um, and trying as best as you can to sort of honor that because you can literally find yourself with 12 hours of breaks. Um, but I also think, you know, just clear outcomes with every meeting. So not just an agenda, but an outcome for every agenda item. And then as Kylie was saying, you know, you can structure that pre-work to, to tee that up and so that you can really minimize the discussion times. Discussions are very inefficient, especially virtually. So you really want to be very conscious about what does need to be discussed. There's, you know, some specific things for that dynamic interaction. There's no substitute for that. And you want to make sure that you're reserving your meeting time for exactly that. And anything that can move, be moved offline that you're, you know, you're putting that extra effort in to really plan out, not just the meeting, but what's happening before the meeting, what's happening after the meeting to really make highest value use of that scarce discussion time. Awesome. Caroline, you wanna layer on that? Cause I know, especially with starting a new role and all that stuff, there's been a lot of organization <laughs> you've done. Exactly. So I do actually observe that an hour where I have just check on an email, eat, do other things to get up from the computer so that I'm not over stretching my neck or something like that. In the morning, my daughter and I will do yoga before we both start our day just to have that peaceful mindset and just some other time that we can spend together before we go off to mom work and kid work. And then my husband has you know, his office at home, so we're able to do that. And then making sure we align the systems, meaning, I need the computer that has the good camera from this time to this time. Okay, when's your live meeting? When's this call? And just making sure that we have one stop shop where everybody knows to look at the schedule to say, oh, mom's using the computer. Okay, great. Or I have something else that's coming up and it's like, okay, well, we'll reserve this time and I'll put things on my calendar and let my team know if you see this time slot, you know, feel free to send me information. I'll look at it during that time, but I'll get back to you by this hour. So that way I'm not overestimating the time it's going to take me to review something. I'm able to be there for my home life, but also responding back to my team. So they are not just sending something into the ether and thinking I'm not able to look at it or I'm too busy. As I said earlier, my calendar looks like a disaster because I want to have those intentional conversations with them as I am trying to get to know them and manage the outcomes of what we're tasked with doing in, in our HR organization. But just really making sure that it's written down, that everybody understands it. Uh, my assistant, I use uh, color coding for different things. So she knows if that's an internal uh, task that I'm working on or if it's something related to the team. And that way she can look at it and not have to try to find where I am. She understands what's going on or if there's things she needs to prep for me. We absolutely use um, the consent agenda like we use for our advisory council meeting where it was sent ahead of time, everyone could look at it. We were able to think about what we needed to discuss and have a very efficient meeting. And so modeling some of that in, you know, in our everyday life as well. Excellent. Kylie, anything to add on? 
A couple of random things. I mean, creating just your family schedule, right? I mean, mine are teenagers, so they don't have to wake up till earlier. So I'm like, okay, that's my focus time where I can just, it's, it's, it's my critical time. But then I think blocking your calendar ahead of time. So you don't get those 12 hours. Cause I, same thing. I'm, I can be on 12 hours of zoom calls a day. I think just blocking yourself off for either that, like get up and walk around time is so critical. And that's where my team and I decided to switch to virtual one-on-ones, like a walking one-on-one, like let's get on the phone. Let's not be on zoom because we are together several other times during the week. Um, that's really been helpful too. And just to change his pace and you get outside and some fresh air. Um, but um, personally, I, I like you might spend seven hours doing it, but honestly, like meal prep, <laughs> and I, it, it's something that's like so silly and sometimes get in the habit, but it has been so helpful to just have like a bunch of meals ready that I can throw in the oven or that they can just grab food out of the fridge or we can all kind of be eating off of. So you're not trying to make something every single meal. And so you're not cooking like 15 meals a day for five different people. Um, I think that's just, I know it's something so simple and it feels, but that has been so helpful. Um, and so you're not feeling like a short order cook to everybody all day long. Um, those are just some of the little things that we're trying to find balance. But I think I, I agree, like find a little time, find a little space for yourself, walk around, get up. Cause I definitely am like sitting in a chair for 12 hours. It's not something I'm used to either. Yeah. And I always have lived by my calendar. And so it's been, I, I've, you know, carved those things that luckily I've got a Fitbit. And so it reminds me every, you know, 50 minutes to get up and walk. And then I put on my neck and back, you know, kind of shoulder um, video and it's made a world of difference, little silly things, but um, those are the things you need to, to kind of transform what you're doing. We've got some great uh, questions in chat. So I'm going to throw out a couple of those before I get back to, to the questions that we've had. Um, so Derek says, I have several clients who prefer to meet in person how can one get their respective client to buy into the fact that the meeting will and can be as effective and productive as an in-person meeting? So what are some thoughts on that? I have some thoughts on that, Derek, (laughs) as a business owner myself. Um, And this is actually something I I would have thrown out at at some point in our conversation. Um, A key thing, and this is really for everyone, is to also know the tools that are available. For, to support virtual meetings. It's not all about Zoom or WebEx or Adobe Connect. Those tools are in one family of virtual tools, which I call, which have primarily a presentation oriented and video oriented strength to them. But they don't allow what I call parallel processing of ideas. They don't allow a very efficient rack and stack or voting or rating, multi-criteria rating of ideas that you might do in like a strategic planning type session. There's a whole nother family of tools that allow those kinds of things. Decision support tools is what they're called. Things like meeting sphere, group systems think tank, and there's expert choice. There's a number of them. The fact is actually virtual meetings can be as productive and even more productive than in-person meetings. But the key is really knowing that outcome, picking the right tool to support that outcome and having some thoughtful meeting design behind that meeting. I think if you can demonstrate to your client by first asking some questions to get really clear on what that outcome is, and then maybe you, Derek, and your team, you know, sort of getting conversant, if not fluent, get conversant in the various families of collaborative tools where you can show your client, hey, listen, you know, we've, we've got a, you know, a proposal for how we can get that order of business done just as efficiently and even maybe even more effectively than an in-person meeting without incurring the risk right now of an in-person meeting, you're likely to have success. I mean, we're having, you know, we're having people come in, you know, $50,000 for two day strategic planning workshops all the time now for virtual work. They know they need the virtual help. They're just not familiar enough necessarily to know how valuable those in, those virtual meetings really can be. And I think some, you know, if you back up even to the point of sometimes it's, they feel, uh, again, it's that vulnerability element. They feel like they're not as effective. So how can you have that conversation with regards to what is it that you're concerned about? Is it you're concerned about effectiveness? Then to April's point here, the outcomes, this is what we're going to, let's try it out. Let's see if, if we have these specific outcomes, let's test it. One thing in this virtual environment that I think people are being forced to do is that whole element of fail fast. 
So let's try it. Let's try something. Let's see if we can make this 20 minutes as effective as possible. What's our desired outcome? Desired let's outcome. Go from it. Let's go um, from it. So I think you um, have to balance that for, for sure, but have that conversation because it could be, I just don't feel comfortable in this environment. And, um, and so, you know, then it's, it's kind of working through that with them and, and showing them the impact. And you could always dry run it with a lower stakes thing. You could always say, hey, listen, you know, let's, let's just do a dry run with, with a lower stakes meeting and see how that goes. That might give that client that comfort level. Excellent. Anything that to add? A teenager sighting. I saw, we saw. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like it. And I think, um, I think it's all about being intentional. And I love that. The, like, what is the outcome? How can you set it up? What can you do to pre-read? Like what's the stuff that actually has to be discussed inside of a meeting? What do we need to capture and know? And I think that sometimes um, we just went through some like calibration sessions and things like that. And okay, we, we gathered all of our info before everybody had a chance to pre-read. So then our discussion was really only an hour where normally we literally would have sat in a three hour meeting before. So I think it, like if you're just shifting things up and doing them differently, you can be really effective. It's just approaching it in a different way. The other thing, um, like for a monthly business review, we actually chunked it out into a couple different days. So not making things as long um, because sitting, you know, for eight hours, just listening to people talk all day is not super, you know, and it's like, how are you presenting? So we have just some learnings and trainings and how do you make it more interactive and make it more adult learning? Um, you know, speaking to professionals here, we're just not used to that. So I think it's just like changing how you maybe like looking at your approach can also help too. And maybe it's just different from the way you did it the last time. Excellent. We also have a question in here. Any suggestions? I know I've seen a lot of this um, come up in different literature and stuff, but how suggestions for handling micromanaging from supervisors due to this remote work environment where they're, you know, taking that concept of, of connectivity to the nth degree and, you know, constantly kind of um, micromanaging the folks around them. What are some suggestions or thoughts with regards to how to work in that kind of environment? How do you handle that person above you who's micromanaging? Well, I can say one thing that I've coached other managers on is manage the outcome, not necessarily the process, because you want to ensure that people have adequate time to actually research whatever the question is, depending upon the, the thematic uh, area where they happen to work. But manage the outcome. Is there a deadline that you've provided? Well, let them meet the dead time, deadline. Is the work quality what you expected? If it isn't, then have some conversations or perhaps do more of those quick touch points and be very intentional and saying, we're going to check in every day because of the importance of this. But if it's a quick turnaround, great. You can use that time to finish whatever project versus just on an ad hoc basis, following up with them or sending them an IM for which they have to, or instant message, stop, look at it, figure out what's going on, just coming up with that protocol. But I can say I've counseled many on, well, how will I know if they're doing work? And I said, well, what did you do when they were in the office? I hope you weren't walking around all day double checking people because I would ask, what's your time management strategy? So thinking about what are the outcomes? What are the stake of the project? It doesn't have a specific deadline, everything COVID related. It's a lot of times it is something every day we're dealing with. And so just making sure everyone's aware of that and then let the talented individuals that we've hired to meet our mission do the work they're paid to do versus stopping and, and interrupting them at, at every stake because you need comfort. You know, it's, there's a different way that they could be managing that. Great. April or Kelly to add? Well, it could be that you could proactively communicate also like, hey, here's my plan for the week. So you're managing up a little bit if they're, if your supervisor or manager isn't to that space and you could help them get there. So potentially saying, hey, here's my plan for the week. Does this align with what you're thinking? What could I provide to you to ensure that I'm meeting your expectations? So it's almost like, yeah, I would say do a reverse and manage up of that. Yeah. Yeah, I actually just had a, a little blurb published in Forbes on this very thing. I totally kind of agree, Kylie, with that because I talk about um, like situation reports. That's something that we do in emergency operations centers in, in a crisis. Um, and initially that might be twice daily. That might be on the hour, like right when COVID was first sort of breaking, it was on the hour. And then it might move to, you know, weekly and in a real, you know, normal business environment, you might be doing a monthly status report or something. 
but in a virtual world, you might want to do that, you know, daily even, hey, here's what I'm planning to do tomorrow. You know, here's what, you know, here are the significant outcomes to, you know, to the point made earlier that, you know, that have been achieved today. And, and here's what I forecast for the coming week or month, but sort of keep that kind of cycle going. Um, but I agree with maybe just get in conversation, be proactive and get in conversation with your boss or your clients, as I like to say, and, you know, what would they like, what would help them, you know, feel like they had a pulse on things and then to make sure you're not sort of veering off too far off course. Excellent. Well, I know we've got various age uh, ranges on the call from people who are just starting out in their careers to people who are, have been in their careers and stuff like that. Um, in, in this virtual environment, um, obviously, uh, folks coming out, you know, our recent graduates are concerned. Uh, how am I going to get hired? What do I need to do to stand out? And, you know, what can I do to be effective? And I, I would say that same thing happens now to all the people who are back in the workforce because they have been let go or furloughed or what have you. Um, so what can people do in this environment to stand out as, as a candidate or a potential employee or, you know, to enhance their skills in, in their current job? What are your thoughts in terms of how to distinguish yourself in this virtual world. And Kylie, we can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, it was interesting. The masterclass list of, you know, cloud management, cybersecurity, blockchain, all, I mean, the, the future is about technology and data, no matter what your job is. As HR professionals, we need to know how to optimize technology in order to do our job better and bring data into it so we're having, making data-driven decisions. So I would say if you have, like say, say you are laid off, go take advantage of these master classes because that is going to enhance everything you do. And if all of a sudden you do want to reskill or retrain, technology is a great area. I know it's gonna be the core area that we actually are hiring at, at Nike. Um, next year where others you really won't but you will need that that those those data and understanding of the tools and the systems and how to optimize um, in anything you do so I would say that's a, a one like quick way to stand out and then I would say um, you know use your network um, LinkedIn all the like it's been around forever but it is it is it is a very robust platform and don't be afraid to set up you know, meaningful conversations with people and talk about, you know, what are you looking for? What makes people stand out? I mean, we need people who have the skills to do the job, but they have to be, you know, these future thinkers and these optimizers and people that are going to make things better. And it just, you know, we're not just going to hire every athlete. Like, you know, you need to like, you know, if you enjoy just the movement of, of a body or watching sport or whatever it might be, you have to have skills to do the job, but then you have to have these capabilities of the future. And I think a lot of it is that ambiguity, being able to be this like bigger picture thinker, being able to optimize um, and, and navigate and being like solutions oriented is huge. So I think, and how do you portray that on, a, on, you know, on your LinkedIn profile? Add it into that top summary and then network for sure. And then add those skills in those master classes that, that hopefully should, should set you up on a more successful path. Great. April or Caroline, anything to add on? I was just going to say, yes, just gonna more say, than yes, ever, even ever, ever how to go to your network, your mentor, or someone that is a, a group of friends that you trust to look at your resume if you are in fact uh, seeking employment or if you are thinking about making a job changed, now's a great opportunity to do some of those classes, I would say in a manner that is not going to overwhelm them. So now it's one more thing to try to pile onto their schedule and balance with everything else with, with their home life and what have you. And also thinking about what are those type of skill sets that are gradual, what are things that you can do in a self-study perspective. I mean, obviously if you think you want to go to medical school, that's not something you can do <laughs> online per se. And so really thinking about where are those areas where either someone has said, it's not a skill deficiency, but it's something that can be strengthened. I've also said to my team, you know, now is a great opportunity, not only to balance the customer's work that we're, we're dealing with, but where you want to take some additional class to keep your skill and, and keep current with what's going on in the human capital world, whether it's private sector or public sector, allowing time to do that and just giving me a heads up so I can provide the appropriate cover for the other teams if someone is going to be offline for you know an hour watching a webinar or the things that we they're learning 
and individuals are able to connect and partner in, in those ways. But definitely reaching out to mentors and having someone else that maybe hasn't, you haven't looked your resume in a while and having that assist you uh, to really look at the skill sets and look at those accomplishment statements that you want to include. Great, April? Just to quickly, you know, sort of pile on, because I agree with all of that. And I, I just want to echo, you know, Kylie's admiration for those master classes that GMU is offering and those kind of two week boot camps. I mean, that's just insane. That is so awesome that GMU is offering that. You know, the, lands the landscape of the planet is changing forever with this crisis. Things are changing forever. And I really believe there will be an acceleration on the technology front. It was already well underway with artificial intelligence, machine learning, data-driven decision-making. That will be accelerating. So I think taking the kinds of classes that you guys are offering, Christine, is, is just so important. And ironically, good old-fashioned relationship building is going nowhere. And so picking up the phone, and even if you still have a job, you know, it sounds like in, in Nike, Kylie was saying, you know, they're doing kind of the phone walks. Not every company's doing that. And, you know, you used to just run into people kind of organically in the lunchroom or in the hallway or on your way to your office. And that's not happening now. So you do need, I really encourage people, invest a lot more time than you norm than you think you need to in in making some old fashioned phone calls and and checking in on folks and even if it's just to to check in on how they're doing you know maybe it's just a quick call it doesn't always have to be about business but maintain those relationships do not let those just fade out to pasture Excellent. And I think, you know, especially now it, it's um, so important because everybody has got such a diverse experience. So even though we're all in this kind of common working from home and stuff, it, it runs the gamut. And so um, I find one of the things that keeps me going is just learning from people's, you know, unique challenges and reaching out and connecting and understanding and being empathetic, but learning, you know, because it's going to help you to navigate with, you know, my students who I know are facing a lot of different things or employees are facing a lot of different things. So the more information we can have um, and, and connections we can make are, are going to be, you know, critical. Um, we only have a few more minutes left. So I, I want to, since connections is, is something um, we've been talking about, how can people connect with their bosses or their clients? What are some things that we've talked about? Good old fashioned, just pick up the phone and, and make it happen. I'm a CPA, so I've actually created an Excel spreadsheet with the people I want to connect with and when I've connected with them. Um, because time goes by so fast. And, and you know, I was just asking Carrie Lane when she started, was it three weeks ago? And she said six, six to seven weeks ago. So time goes by so fast if you're not purposeful about it and really tracking it you know, th this time is going to be gone before we know it. But what are some things, some tactical things? We've gotten some great ones already with regards to the walks and different things you can do. But what is, what would you leave our audience with, with regards to some things that they can do to make connections with boss, with clients, with customers, you know, fill in the blank, but how can they maintain and build those relationships now? And April, we'll start with you and then we'll go around. Okay, I'll just quickly jump in. Um, you know, I think a key thing, especially with bosses or clients, is, um, you know, asking, and I think this has been hit on earlier, but really staying attuned to what do they care about? What's keeping them up at night? And it may be different than you think. For example, my company for seven years provided a lot of strategic planning work and long-term consensus building work around change. But you know what? Ain't a lot of people caring about that right now in our sectors. They are in a crisis mode. They are moving out of that and into a longer term survival and recovery mode. And so we're pivoting our business because that's what they care about. That's what's keeping them up at night. We're using all of our same skill sets, but we're pivoting it into something that is keeping our client base up at night. So every individual on this call, you know, just constantly staying attuned. What is keeping your boss up at night and your client up at night? And thinking to yourself and maybe even offering, hey, I could possibly help here or here. Let me know if that might be of interest. You know, constantly positioning yourself in a value context relative to what they care most about. And it's interesting because I, I love that idea. And what I've been trying to do as well as I've been trying to keep myself up, then if I find something of interest for a client or for a student or for whomever, sending that to them. That's another way to connect in a very easy fashion. I read this article. I instantly thought of you. You know, I hope you find it useful. And it starts a dialogue often with somebody saying, you know, thanks. I, I needed that. I needed somebody to connect with me. Um, so doing something like that can be very simple. 
Carrie Lane, how about you? So I definitely want to reiterate the theme of being intentional. And so I look at it from a few different, uh, in my work life, because I am interacting with my peers, my boss, my staff, and many of whom I've never met before, even though we've been working together for the past almost seven weeks. And so making sure that when I set up one-on-ones, I just put a couple of bullets in there to say, we're going to talk about everything, business, what's going on, are there things we need to shift? And that way I can have a pulse of getting to know them, working through whatever challenges mm -hmm. they might be suffering or if things are going really well, great. And having them map with others and match up with others who maybe aren't handling the ambiguity as well. So again, that internal piece. As far as connecting in personal, you know, I do uh, Skype sessions with my family in New Jersey, so I can still stay connected with them. I would do probably quarterly touch-ins with all of my friends from across, and it's just now making sure that we stick with that because I will say the, the positive aspect is everybody around the globe is going through this change all at once. It's just individual situations and stories vary. And so making sure that people realize, hey, I'm there for you, even just a text message emoji and your favorite one to say hi and stay connected. For my team, I say, if you need to send me an instant message, please do. We'll schedule a time. I want to make sure that I'm available, but then also being intentional with my schedule to say between eight and nine is when I need to get my daughter set with school things. But anytime after this, I'm available and just making sure that everybody has that for their planning and again, scheduling when we need to have that one-on-one -one time. And so being very intentional, that's kind of my theme of, theme of managing through COVID. Perfect. Kylie. I mean, I've kind of talked about some of the things we're doing, but um, you know, with our, with my, my team, like I said, they're really close. Um, but we've, we've even instituted like a buddy system. So it's not always me connecting, um, but it's that they're connecting with each other. So we've almost created a little system. So others are like creating different connections. And then we even did something silly, like get to know your buddy. <clears throat> and we just did questions around their silly questions. Like, if an insect was really big, what insect would be the scariest? I mean, it's just more of getting to know and we're sharing them out with the team. So there's a couple, just, you know, a silly connection. Um, but I think really then with, with, with my team itself is just getting to know their situation individually and knowing what works for them. So just really making sure that, you know, it's a, it, we lead with the people first and person first has been um, important. And then I, I think it's already been said, but like, managing up to my to my leader and then my core client who is you know rapidly evolving his organization i think it's it's um getting ahead of it providing information before they need it and almost solutioning before they need it hey i saw this here's a potential solution and getting in front of it has been really helpful because there's so much going on especially in a technology organization as they're managing you know an 80,000 person remote workforce which we've never had to do before is providing those solutions before they have to even think of them. So I think those have really created some great like connections and, and driving in that differentiation that we've talked about before. Um, personally, I mean, yeah, using house party, the like house party app and playing silly games together has been just fun and random. And yeah, the, the same thing, like, why are we not just doing this on a monthly basis and just like making it happen? So terrific. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going to end with a quote and then turn it um, over to Brett um, with regards to, and thank you because we're at the top of the hour, um, in the time of destruction, create something. And that was Maxine Hong Kingston. And I've heard a couple people reference that, but you know, to me, I look at it at such an optimistic time as my dog starts to bark, um, such an optimistic time um, to do something different, to stand out differently. And we're hoping that these professional skills will get you there. Um, do let us know what other ones we'd love to make this be a regular series that we do on professional skills. Um, and to the point, I think, Brett, you'll address it with regards to the question on, you know, potential scholarships and things that people can do to pay for master classes. But there's also a ton of free stuff out there. These webinars are free. Um, I was on actually a Harvard um, Business Review webinar earlier today. It was fantastic. There was a question here about um, presentation skills. Send me an email and, and we'll have our email information. I'm happy to share some of the ones that are out there that are free that you can sign up for. So that a lot of companies are being um, very, uh, you know, generous with regards to sharing information these days. So take advantage of the things that are free in addition to looking for opportunities for scholarships and other things. But thank you for your active questions, everybody in the panel. Um, thank you for your time, your, your commitment. 
I learned some great stuff I'm gonna take notes on. Um, and Brett, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks everybody once again. Uh, we'll end it uh, with kind of these, these last little points. We'll continue to have content from Mason Executive Development as Christine was kind of alluding to. This is, as her and I have stepped into these roles specifically, outreach has been a huge part about what we've been trying to move Mason forward or continue its mission. Um, Mason is about access to excellence. And so when we look at these series of courses and content, it's being brought out of, you know, from a place or from a perspective, from our hearts of saying, we want to give back to Mason alumni, to the community, by providing access to the excellent faculty that you have here at Mason. Um, so we will work with it. These are not master's classes, so they're not graduate level credits or courses. These are, you know, things that would be not for, for credit that you can get that would provide you a designation that you'd have those skills put on your LinkedIn page and say you're, you're now able to start doing uh, cloud management, cybersecurity, blockchain. Um, so continue to look for more uh, amazing content from George Mason University, from executive development, as we continue to provide access to our faculty and, and the insights that we're, we're all trying to just get through the day and see how we can make a difference in our careers and in the community right now. Um, and I do want to echo, you know, a point that Christine and as a last one is we do want to make this uh, a kind of a routine series. I think professional skills are something that we all need to figure out uh, and, and to get better at, especially we, you know, how do you even interview or how do you go through an interview? How do you engage on a virtual environment? How do you stand out? Um, so continue to look for those probably uh, next month. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you for the panelists. Um, thank you everyone for joining and we will see you next time.